Stop, you haven't subscribed to the channel yet. Subscribe now, we have new stories every day. Now let's go. Johnny Nash, oh yes, I can do it now that the pain is gone, all the bad feelings have disappeared, and here it is, the rainbow I prayed for. It's going to be a bright, dazzling, sunny day. Some people never get the chance to live vicariously through their children, but like my son Doug, I'm fortunate. He plays in college. I trained him and his sister Franny very diligently when they were young. Both of them watched closely as I played in amateur football leagues. My weekends were dedicated to their football tournaments, where they both were stars. During the weekdays, I would drive them to and from practices and skill training sessions at any park that wasn't in use. They were involved in sports every month of the year, but football was where they truly excelled. Additionally, my wife Shay wanted them to be so engrossed in sports that it would be hard for them to engage in more risky activities. At first glance, it worked. Doug quit football before his senior year of high school and turned down football scholarships. We think it was mostly out of rebellion, something like, take that. It worked well enough for him, and he became the striker of the school soccer team and sometimes played as a winger. So how did it happen that I'm watching Doug play in college? Tech thought he had the strongest leg they'd seen in a long time and offered him a football scholarship. He was supposed to kick field goals, but he performed so well as a player that he became their number one kicker. Naturally, Franny was incredibly annoyed. Doug quit football, causing a lot of outrage, and yet he ended up smelling like a rose. Now, in the rearview mirror, all the Division II schools are chasing after Franny. She wants to play at a Division I school, just like her brother. Ah, the sibling rivalry. At every home game, Shay and I have seats in the section reserved for players' parents. What makes the game even cooler is that everyone actually sits and watches the game from the moment the fly drops until it's all over. Another plus is that the section for drunk students is far away from us. If we wanted, the school could get us tickets for away games too. We haven't done that yet, but we plan to attend one or two. Our local TV station has a contract to broadcast all of Tech's games. I record them in the cloud. When the quarterback throws a touchdown pass, they zoom in on his parents to see their reaction. When the running back scores, they zoom in on his parents. And when the kicker makes an incredible field goal, they switch to his parents. Well, who can blame them? Parents aren't exactly sociable, especially if your child loves playing football. During the first home game, we didn't make many friends in the stands, but it was still a lot of fun. Although my short business trips never made me anxious, the upcoming product launch was scheduled for a weekend in another state. I had to miss the game, but I planned to watch it later in my hotel room. I would have preferred to be at the stadium, but work pays the bills, and a player's scholarship doesn't cover all the expenses. Shay and I met shortly after college. Our company sent us to the same seminar. Our first encounter was uneventful. Brooke Zellman, you're not related to Charles Zellman, are you? Asked an attractive brunette, glancing at my name badge. Well, Shay Wilson, as far as I know, no, I responded. I suppose you know him? I tore my gaze away from her chest and the name badge beside it. Actually, he was a year ahead of me in high school. I just thought, with your unique last name, there might be a chance. She smiled. Maybe we should grab a drink tonight, and I'll find out if you're related to Nancy Wilson. I smiled back. Nice line. Sure, I'll meet you in the hotel lobby after the last session. Later, as I stood in the hotel lobby, wondering if Shay had stood me up, one of my colleagues started talking to me. He was engrossed in the last presentation, so I pretended to be interested. Out of the corner of my eye, I noticed Shay. Sorry to interrupt, but my friend is here, I said and turned toward her. Hi Shay, ready to go? I asked. Breeze? Yeah, it's a combination of my first and last name. I've heard it all my life, so it kind of stuck with me. Well, Breeze, you offered to buy me a drink. Let's go. It might sound cliche, but we really hit it off that evening. After a gentle kiss on the lips, I wanted more, but that didn't happen until a few months and several dates later. It was worth the wait. There was nothing unusual about our courtship and marriage. Her parents seemed to like me, and mine liked her. Since our budget was limited, it was a small event with about 40 people attending. We chose a starter home roughly halfway between her office and mine. Two years later, we had Doug, and less than two years after that, Franny came along. Since this was my first and only marriage, I had no doubt there would be arguments. We could find the silliest reasons to fight. There wasn't enough money. There wasn't enough time. I should have consulted Shay first. Why am I bothering her with this? We went out of our way to frustrate each other until the dust from the argument settled. To put an end to our abusive behavior toward each other, we eventually agreed to see a therapist. It seemed to help a bit, but we still had a long way to go. One Saturday evening, after a minor argument, one Saturday evening, after a minor argument about something I can't even remember, we decided to attend my company's party.
Shay shamelessly flirted and danced all night, trying to provoke me into making a scene. I watched her like a hawk, but she kept pulling her hands toward me. There were touches, however, and chased kisses and hugs. I wasn't going to play her game. On the way home, Shay tried to start a fight. Some of your salesmen said you seemed to enjoy it when they flirted with me. Sometimes, bodies are never found. They just disappear. No custody or alimony disputes. Her eyes widened, and she fell silent. It was cold in our house for more than a week. No apologies were made. What really infuriated me was that a week after the party, one of the salesmen told me I wasn't worthy of the hot babe I was married to. One jerk even had the nerve to ask if we had an open marriage. A note on my desk said that since I was inadequate in bed, I should let her go. Every weekend on the day Tech played State, I asked Shay not to tell me how it turned out. I wanted to watch it in my room while enjoying dinner and drinks the company paid for. To keep the suspense, I turned off my phone during the game. The game itself was sloppy, which is typical for teams playing at lower levels. Doug made a few kicks towards the end of the third quarter. Doug kicked again, but this time, an overly aggressive defensive player took him down with a blatant cheap shot. Personal foul, robbing the kicker. But Doug remained on the ground. The nearby players looked frightened and took a knee. The replay showed Doug's leg bending in a way it was never meant to bend. When the Theismann broadcast rule kicked in, they didn't show the replay of him breaking his leg. In 1985, quarterback Joe Theismann was sacked, and his leg was broken in the most gruesome way. We all know this because it was shown from multiple angles about a thousand times. The reaction was immediate and intense. Broadcasters now avoid showing graphic footage. After watching the video, I replayed the collision several times. Doug definitely wouldn't play again this season. Eventually, they loaded him onto a cart and took him to the hospital. As I had guessed, he waved as the crowd cheered him on. I paused the broadcast and turned on my cell phone. I went through numerous texts and voice messages from friends and family. Then I called Shay. She was very upset. Doug was in surgery, and she promised to call me back when she knew more. After contacting the airlines, I realized I wouldn't be able to get home that night. The food had gone cold, and I was out of beer. What else could go wrong? Never tempt the gods like that. I continued watching the broadcast. As the cart rolled across the field, they cut to the parent section and showed Shay, tears streaming down her face, covering her mouth with her hands. Robert Marks was comforting her. He's a salesman at my company and was one of the guys who had been hitting on her at the company party. He kissed her on the forehead and held her close to his chest. What the hell was he doing in my seat, comforting my wife? The credits on the screen even mistakenly identified them as Brock and Shay Zellman, a six-second clip that ended my ignorance and likely my marriage. My phone rang occasionally. I didn't answer any calls but listened to the messages. None of them, including Shay, mentioned the six-second clip. In Shay's message, she said Doug had regained consciousness. I called the university hospital and was connected to Doug. How are you, Dad? He asked in his usual upbeat voice. How are you, Dad? He asked in his usual upbeat voice. I just saw you get tackled in the game. How bad is it? Well, the season's over, but I only got a few broken bones and some ligament damage. At least it's not my kicking leg. They operated on me almost immediately and moved me back to this room not long ago. I'll be fine in a few months. Do football players get special treatment in the hospital? Yeah, I guess so. A couple of the younger nurses are being a bit too friendly. That should make me popular at frat parties since I'll need some night nursing care, he chuckled. That's my boy, always looking for a way to make the best of it. Well, I have to go. Glad to hear it's nothing too serious. I'll see you when I get home. Love you. Wait, mom wants to talk to you. Tell her I'm busy and working on something important. Good night. Good night, dad. My heart was still pounding. Sometimes you see a kid get hit and they can't walk again. I dodged that bullet. I turned my phone off again. I had no desire to talk to anyone else tonight. The company I work for manufactures data storage devices and search software for tracking movements using GPS. Most often, they're used for tracking or mapping. Nowadays, almost all cars send out a signal that is captured by our software. You can determine a change in their global location and then calculate how quickly they made that change. By matching GPS readings with known highways, you can see how traffic is moving. Mapping doesn't rely on a single vehicle but aggregates all the traffic flows in that direction. Repeat this for all roads in all directions and you begin to understand the immense storage requirements. All that's recorded is just the device identifier, coordinates, and a timestamp. When you think about it, it's pretty simple. Law enforcement uses it to detect people at crime scenes. How do I know this? I was on the team that wrote the software. When it was time to take action, I decided to play detective. Before the data was archived, I had done this countless times. When the police call, we cross-check devices for the time leading up to the crime. 
vehicles that slowly drive through the area and then return a day or two later on the same day the crime was committed are usually thoroughly investigated. Vehicles that had never stopped by the house before, and then something bad happens around that time, are also scrutinized. Such tools make it easier to identify potential suspects. Several court cases have challenged this as a violation of privacy rights. Most have lost as it really isn't much different from eyewitness testimony. With the exact global coordinates of my home, I begin searching for all GPS signals near that location starting around 2 o'clock a.m. on Saturday. As expected, there was little activity at that time of night. Around 8 o'clock a.m., the database detected a new device and almost immediately a second device. The first was likely Shay's car, and the second was her mobile phone after it disconnected from the home Wi-Fi. After compiling data from both devices into a temporary database, I tracked where these devices had moved since then. Shay's car stopped moving around 8.30 a.m., but her cell phone continued to move. Gathering this data, I began tracking the phone's movement through streets and buildings. What I discovered made my blood boil. Her car stopped at a house belonging to Robert and Teresa Marks. Her mobile phone stayed there until about 11 o'clock a.m., and then it went to the football stadium on Tech's campus. So she had her own little get-together at the Marks residence. Maybe they were just betting on the game and checking stats, right? My turn to call that a load of nonsense. Around the time Doug was taken to the university hospital, Shay's mobile phone arrived there as well and remained there currently. I think she will need a ride to pick up her car. On a sudden impulse, I decided to map out all of Shay's car movements over the past week. This was all I could find without delving into archived databases. I filtered out everything except the stops, and the picture was appalling. As expected, she drove to work, making brief stops, presumably at traffic lights. A stop at the grocery store after work was not surprising. However, a stop at the Marked House on Wednesday from noon until 1.30 p.m. enraged me. Armed with what I now knew, I sent several emails to various companies specializing in tracking people, private detectives as they like to call themselves. Exhausted, I dozed off. In the morning, before turning on my mobile phone, I repeated my search. Shay's phone moved from the hospital around 11 o'clock p.m. and went straight to her car. After a brief delay, her car left the Marx's house and both devices returned to our home shortly before midnight. I received responses to several of my emails inquiring about rates and availability. Of course, they were available to help me, if only my wallet were thicker. It seemed I would need a different strategy. When my cell phone came to life, there were even more well-wishers and an angry Shay, since I hadn't called or texted her. I still wasn't in the mood to talk, so I sent a message saying, going to bed late and getting up early. We'll chat later. My phone rang with an incoming call. Of course, it was Shay, but I just sent it to voicemail. I didn't have to wait at our demo booth for another hour and a half, so I delved into the history of Robert and Teresa Marks. I specifically searched for their email address and phone number, which I found. They had one child, and their daughter went to a different school than Franny. It was time to go to work, so I saved all this information. My plan was for Teresa Marks to discover them if they got together again on Wednesday. The next challenge was to figure out how to provide this information without pointing back to me. During lunch, I gathered a bit more information about Teresa. My plan was to have a photo of Robert Shea and her car printed at a local print shop with a note saying that the car was seen at her house on Wednesday around noon and that the lady and gentleman went inside for an hour and a half. I would leave the envelope for Teresa at her office and let her handle the dirty work. Before my lunch break was over, I called Doug again. He was the center of attention and had even given an interview to our local TV station. It turned out that because he missed a penalty, our team initially lost, but after a few more plays, they scored a decisive goal and held on to win the match. He had to pay a significant price, but he enjoyed it. Shay must have been at the hospital because she called as soon as I hung up with Doug. It's Breeze, she said, irritated. This is your wife. It won't kill you to talk to me. Hey, I'm trying to make a living. What's so important that it can't wait until I get home? There was a pause. I just miss you, and it was really hard when Doug got injured. Well, he seems to be doing fine. My lunch break is ending. I'll call you from the airport later this evening. I didn't wait for a response and ignored the immediate callback. I should probably ease up, otherwise, she might not have her date on Wednesday. I really wanted Teresa to handle this because I didn't think I could avoid jail time if I got involved. I prepared the envelope for Teresa and sent it on my way to the airport. Arriving late on Sunday night gave me only a short time to spend with Shay. On Monday morning, she left for work before I got up. Since I had some free time, I stopped by the university hospital to visit Doug. His cast had too many signatures to count. His current girlfriend, whom I had never met, was very eager to keep him away from the adoring cheerleaders and nurses. Later that same day, Shay sent a message. What time will you be home tonight? 
I replied, a lot of paperwork, so don't wait for me. Eat without me. When I got home around 9 o'clock p.m., I realized that Shay was furious. I thought that if I continued to upset her, she would once again seek comfort in Robert's arms. Our conversation was dominated by my incoherent ramblings about imaginary work problems, my boss and clients. Eventually, Shay said she was going to bed. On Tuesday, Franny sent me a message saying that she had received an invitation to visit campus. It worked out perfectly, and I replied that we should go somewhere and celebrate tonight. When we got home, it was around 10 o'clock p.m., and everyone was exhausted. Once again, I didn't have to spend time with Shay. Wednesday morning brought mixed emotions. I wanted to believe that Shay would never cheat, but that was overshadowed by the desire for Teresa to catch her in the act. Unlike the previous few days, there were no messages from Shay, so closer to the evening, I sent her a note. I'll be home earlier today. Usually, Shay gets home before me, unless she's delayed for work. When Franny came back from practice around 7 o'clock p.m., she looked around and asked, Where's mom? Not sure. I haven't heard anything from her today. I sent a message earlier but didn't get a reply. That might be for the best. She's been a real pain lately. Are you guys okay? I don't know. Pain doesn't quite cover it. What do you want for dinner? I've got some protein dishes so don't worry about me. I dialed Shay's number and left another voicemail. Franny went to bed at her usual time. I started to worry and sent another text message. There was still no response. I checked the database again and confirmed that Shay's car arrived at the Marks house a few minutes after noon. This time, she left around 12.45 p.m. and stopped at a parking lot off the Federal Highway, 50 kilometers north of the city. That's where she was now. Franny left earlier because she had a weight training session before school. Shay did not answer any of my calls or messages. Again, mixed feelings. On my way to work, I stopped by to visit Doug. His girlfriend was there again. No, he hadn't heard anything about his mother recently. He was excited that he was being discharged today. Around 10 o'clock a.m., I was called to the front desk where a man was waiting to speak with me. Nate Bellow introduced himself as a detective. They had found Shay's car and she was locked in the trunk. She was taken to Mercy Heart Hospital. Throughout this, I had to answer the usual questions like, where have you been? Eventually, Detective Bellow got bored and wished me good luck. The way he said it made me think there was something more to the story. Trying to play the role of the concerned husband, I took a bit more personal leave and went to Mercy Heart Hospital. When I arrived, Shay was not in her room, so I waited in the family waiting area. A couple of nurses were chatting and laughing. I think it was the husband. Maybe, but you have to give him credit. I've never seen anyone so thoroughly decorated, and now we have two of them. Were they talking about Shay and Robert? Now I'd really wanted to see her. When they brought Shay back to her room, I couldn't help myself. I burst out laughing. She was painted blue from head to toe. I was told it was printer ink. It would wash off over time. The hospital staff did everything they could, but it would only fully disappear with time. She had to undergo several sessions of alcohol and solvent wiping. Gradually, it should fade. Adding to her new look was a 5-centimeter red spot on her forehead. A nurse called it a crude tattoo. The letter A was carved into her skin with a knife, and then a bit of red ink was applied to the wound, rough but effective. Shay claimed that her car had been stolen. I noticed the nurse rolling her eyes. I look horrible, Che was sobbing. But at least you're alive. Where were you when this happened? What time? My questions were ignored. Shay continued to cry. Her medical chart was hanging on the door, and I glanced at some photos. I almost burst out laughing again. She also had a large red letter A on her chest. It was about 30 centimeters in size, carved using the same method with a knife and red ink. When I stepped out into the hallway, one of the nurses said to another, and she looks exactly like her boyfriend. He was brought in this morning, a few hours after her. Boyfriend? Asked the other nurse. Well, that's what we're guessing. You know, different last names, but they both wear wedding rings. I wandered through the hallways, looking for the room where Robert Marks was located. He had no visitors. Shay had no other injuries, but both of Robert's legs were in casts. Don't I just love it when everything falls into place? It had been a very productive day. The local evening news featured a story about a burglary during which the homeowner's legs were broken, and he was found covered in blue paint. Crime stoppers would pay for any information leading to the arrest of those responsible for this despicable act. When I called the university hospital, Doug was no longer listed as their patient. I decided once again that I needed to know, so I contacted him. When the money ran out, Franny came home at the usual time. Still no mom. Yes and no. She's a patient at Mercy Heart Hospital. Apparently, her car was stolen and they painted it blue. They also drew a small scarlet A on her forehead and a large one on her chest, like that novel about Puritans and marital infidelity. That's what I'm guessing. 
The same hospital has her boyfriend, also painted up in a similar fashion. He was found at his home. Your mom claims her car was stolen, but I don't believe it. You can visit her, but I'm gearing up and searching online for divorce lawyers. I'm fine. Unbelievable. How can you sit there so calmly? I had the whole day to think about it. She's been cheating for at least a month. I think she wanted to leave. I have two wonderful kids from her, but it's time to turn the page. It's a shame I don't have a photo. She looks ridiculous. Franny perked up. Hey, I'm going to visit mom. She just smiled. Yes, she even managed to convince her mom to show her the big red A. Eh. The photos are posted on her social media page along with information that her lover is in a similar situation. Throwing oneself under a bus, now that's something. My parents and Shay's parents called, and I repeated the story about the stolen car, giving them information about her room. I even heard back from Doug. He seemed not to care about the consequences. Since I was no longer interested in how things were going with the tech football team, I persuaded Franny to visit the campus this weekend. Within an hour, she had booked plane tickets, a hotel, and rented a car. On Friday afternoon before the flight, Shay sent me a text, Are you coming to see me? I wanted to reply no, but Franny convinced me to send, no, but your boyfriend has two broken legs, so he might need company. He's staying five houses down by the elevators. After landing, I discovered a steady stream of missed calls while we were in the air. I just ignored the calls. I had a wonderful weekend with Franny. Well, actually, on Friday evening, I sent her off to the football team, and I had only received messages since then. After spending 48 hours by myself, I was ready to go home. I took some time to arrange a meeting to start the divorce process. On Saturday evening, I watched the tech game. I'm glad I did. Doug got more airtime than in all his previous games combined. They even did an interview with him in his hospital room. His girlfriend was struggling to keep him at bay, while Doug was surrounded by several charming beauties. When Franny and I returned late on Sunday evening, the lights were on in the house, and several cars were parked outside. Time for an ambush. We went inside and saw the cheater and her parents sitting in the living room. Shay had a ghostly glow to her, as the blue paint was still visible. The red A on her forehead was covered with a bandage. Ignoring Shay, I looked at her parents. Hi, Dad. Mom, what brings you here so late at night? Stop talking nonsense. You weren't around to take Shay home. Oh, right. I forgot that her boy has two broken legs. I'm at fault. He's not my boyfriend, Shay said. Lover, fling, Franny giggled. Her grandmother responded, young lady, watch your language. Franny was thrilled. So, Mom, do blue instruments taste the same as all the others? Shay jumped up, and I thought she was going to slap Franny. Her father yanked her by the ponytail, and she popped back down between her parents. Never threaten my granddaughter again, came the angry voice of her father. I took the initiative. Listen, Shay, you've ruined your marriage, and I'm filing for divorce. I expect the papers to be filed this week. Franny will be going off to college next fall, so we need to arrange visitation. Once she's gone, I'll sell my half of the house. Just like that. Agree or disagree? Oh, now you want to talk. It's a bit late for that, don't you think? I'd ask you why, but I already understand that it doesn't really matter. Shay's father intervened. She will have lawsuits. You'll be held responsible for this. Lawsuits? I asked. Yes, the police charged her with providing false information. They used the GPS navigator to locate her car, which she claimed was stolen. There was no theft. Wonderful. I'll probably have to split the cost for new blue outfits, I said sarcastically. Franny giggled, and blue eyeliner. Also blue accessories like handbags and shoes. Shay's mother snapped, enough already. Why don't you make things easier for everyone and take her with you? We'll even help pack one or two suitcases. No, this is my house and I'm staying, Shay snapped back. Well, it's been a long weekend and I'm going to bed. You can sleep on the couch. I locked the bedroom door. I'm not sure when they left, but Shay's parents were not home in the morning. Franny had already gone. I left as quickly as I could. One day, there was a gift from Franny waiting for me on the kitchen table. It was a t-shirt with the slogan, I'm almost as cool as my daughter. I wore it on the day of her college signing ceremony at the high school. Franny was set to succeed, playing soccer for a Division I school. As expected, I had to endure several interviews with the authorities. My lawyer was always by my side, as I wasn't about to let my guard down. Since Teresa's brother owns a printing company, both she and he were mentioned as suspects, but no charges were ever filed. Doug recovered and started his second year as the top player. I'm still amazed that no one ever mentioned seeing Shay with anyone else at that soccer game. The sign on the screen must have missled everyone except me. Franny's freshman year was a tough challenge for her. She had no time for games as she was on the bench due to a large number of upperclassmen. However, her scholarship was extended and now she has plenty of playing time.
Doug has grown his hair out, and almost every time I see him, he has a new girlfriend. Whether at home or on the road, I attend both kids' games when work permits. What could be better than such a legacy? I rarely go on dates, but that is gradually starting to change. It took most of the year for me to manage a one-night romance. I felt like I was cheating. What's the big deal? I miss what I had, but not what it became. As expected, I see Shay at major events involving our kids. A few times, she brought a guy with her, but it was always the same guy. If we happen to chat, I quickly wrap up the conversation, trying not to be rude and blend in with the other guests. Not letting her ease her conscience is my final small act of revenge. Thanks to everyone who took the time to listen to today's stories. If you enjoyed it, please consider liking and subscribing if you haven't already. Feel free to share your thoughts on the events in the comments below. Take care.